Um, so Steve asked me to come and talk about uh, one, of, one of my favorite subjects, actually, is nanotechnology and uh, how it relates to my employer, Boeing, and the aerospace industry that we're part of. Um, he asked me not to be too technical, and that's great, because I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer. <laughs> so you'll get more technology than science on tap tonight. I think uh, I don't want to dwell too much on the on the abstract, but um, the the point is that we're we're looking at a, a new um, era. We somebody in the Chicago newspaper uh, when the 787 came out said the 787 has put an end to the era of metal airplanes, and so with nanotechnology we're looking at the next era because the composites themselves are more. Uh, friendly to nanotechnology than metals have shown themselves to be. So when we went to a polymeric airplane, plastic airplane, uh, it just opened up all kinds of opportunities. And, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about those tonight. Hey, Russ, could you ask him to turn the sound up a little yeah. more? Can't hear you. you cannot hear me? There we go. All right, good. There so there, there's four parts to this talk. One, First, I'll give you a, a very brief overview, and then talk about the applications, where we see nanotechnology fitting into our, our current airplane strategy. Um, and then uh, talk also about some educational issues, because nanotechnology is not only a new subject, but it's a new, um, new category even. Uh, the old... Um, way of looking at science and chemists, physics, metallurgy, when you get down to the nanoscale, that all becomes blurred. And uh, we're, we're looking at a totally different way of uh, educating our, our students. And then we we'll talk about collaboration, because that's a very important subject to Boeing right now. We, we f face the, the issue of uh, not being able to do everything. We can do anything, but we cannot do everything. So. Uh, it's very important to know how to work with other groups, other people, other countries, other, other entities, and all of that, especially with nanotechnology. So what is nanotechnology? It, it's incredibly small. It's uh, 10 to the minus 9th meters. Um, by comparison, you see a, a bacteria is 1,000 nanometers. Uh, a virus is 100 nanometers. We're talking about enhancing our airplane structure with carbon nanotubes that are one or two nanometers in diameter. Uh, what that does for us in several things, one is the uh, very small size increases the uh, surface area per unit volume tremendously. And uh, somebody, somebody used the term um, a football field in a raindrop. Literally, uh, you can have, if you have nanoscale particles, you can have uh, the surface area is equal to a football field, but the volume is only a raindrop. And that's not an exaggeration. And so anything that has to do with surface area, any property, any characteristic, every any functionality that is contingent or related to surface area is highly uh, enhanced and more, becomes more powerful. Uh, the, other th the other thing is the nanotube is itself the most electrically conductive, the most thermally conductive, the highest strength, the highest stiffness material in the world, in the universe so far. And so if the, 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 the challenge and, and really the, what really is pulling us in this direction is how can we harness that? How can we put that into our airplane? And, and the big issue is multifunctionality. Could we make something that is not only a piece of structure, but it's also electrically conductive. It's also thermally conductive. It's also acoustic damping. It has all of these multifunctionalities, capability, potentially. And the final 
the really interesting thing is we might be able to design materials. We don't not just take materials and design a piece of structure. We could design the materials to be just what we want. We could make it more or less any one of those functions I just talked about, any one of those functionalities. So th those things are just driving, not just Boeing, but uh, the whole world is spending tens of billions of dollars per year on research in this area. It's the biggest material science uh, activity probably since the discovery of Flint. So that's, so we go from the very small to the very large because Boeing's not a chemistry company, it's not a, uh, uh, a material supplier, it makes airplanes, it makes rockets and so how can we get these incredibly small things into our products. And that's, we since 2006, we've actually been uh, working on this. The, the, uh, what really kicked it all off was Toyota. Um, back in the early 90s, they took just simple nylon, nylon six, very inexpensive plastic. They put nano clay not nanotubes, nothing sophisticated like nanotubes or nanoplatelet, just nano clay, which is basically dirt. And they put it in there and, and look what happened. The, uh, the stiffness went up 91%. The strength went up 55%. Um, the CTE went down 52%. That means it's stable, dimensionally stable, coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, all the properties went up. and just by putting a very small percentage of this very small mat material particles, which are nano clay. And, and that, that really caught the interest of industries all over the world. And we have uh, within my world, I, I just found a, f a fellow Boeing bmt -er next to me right here. And uh, we have seen, uh, changes, a lot of changes over the years. When you go from metals, which is an isotropic material, we, in the 1980s, we all fell in love with composite material because now you had the ability to, to tailor the, uh, the, the load carrying capabilities by pointing the fibers this way or that way. Now we're seeing another big leap, another big step, and that's the nano composites. And where we had before, we had this very capable, varied uh, composite material as far as strength and structure. Now we have the possibility that that same structure could carry current. We could replace, we actually have a project. Uh, we're working on replacing copper wire with plastic wire with nanotubes in it. But. Um, as, as wonderful as the new science and the potential is, we, we still are faced with the requirements, the classical requirements of putting out an airplane and putting people on an airplane. Um, it takes, it's taken many years. The, the composite material that went on the 787, we probably spent about 10 years of very active um, testing and evaluating, working with the suppliers before we could comfortable with putting it on an airplane. Um, we have to have supplier chain involvement. Typically, uh, we might have a professor from a university come and say, you know, I just uh, in invented this great new thing. I want to work with Boeing and we want to put it in your wings. Um, that won't work. We have to have the whole value chain. We have to have the material supplier. And there's maybe four or five entities between the, uh, the university and Boeing. University of Boeing, however you want to look at it. And, and they have to be in there from the beginning. They have to be part of the development team. And then w our success stories have done that. Um, and and the, the other entities are the ones that can take it and scale it up. Uh, because if you have a professor who, professor at Univer uh, Washington State University created a, a wonderful new material, but it's, you know, it's in a, it's in a little dish. So, how, how can you get it up to uh, a million pounds or 100,000 pounds in pr production? Those entities in the middle of the value chain are the ones that are skilled in scale-up quality assurance. 
they have to be part of the team. You have to consider that when you're inventing the, the new materials and the new applications. Ultimately, we have to convince the FAA that this is a good, good opportunity, a good material, good application. So um, they also have to be brought along on this path. But the, uh, the big issue, the new issue, when you have a composite material, it has a polymeric matrix and it has carbon fibers or glass fibers. Now when we have a nano composite material, you're introducing a whole other set of constituents, whether it's nanotubes or whatever, and a whole other set of parameters and process issues. And it's, it's, we recognize that it's not possible to do what we did on the 787, where we spent 10 or 15 years developing that material. If we have another material, a nanomaterial, that has all of these wonderful functionalities, it'll take 100 years if we do it the old way. So we have to have the modeling capability. We have to have the computer analysis. We have to be able to certify it with uh, analysis as well as testing. And that's a big issue because none of those models exist today. So the, the, um, the key drivers for any application, whether it's nano or micro or metal or anything, it has to be affordable. And one, one thing that we uh, often talk about is that affordability is not just the price of the airplane. It's what it costs to operate it, what it costs to maintain it, to repair it, and what it's worth when ultimately when you sell it. And all those things put together are called TAROC, total, operating, uh, t total airplane related operating costs. And that's what determines whether the airline will buy it or not buy it. And we want breakthrough performance as, as usual. And we also want uh, uh, environmental friendliness. Um, we have programs going out in biofuels. It turns out one of the biggest benefits to uh, reduced emissions is reduced weight. So we're, we've been working on reducing weight for, for decades. So it's good to find out that the, uh, if you reduce the max takeoff weight, tremendous reduction in uh, the obnoxious emissions for the whole flight. And, and also we have programs working toward uh, uh, how can you have these plastic materials, this plastic airplane, how can you, how can you derive those polymers from uh, renewable resources rather than um, petroleum or non-renewable resources? So we have programs, and as everybody does, in um, bio-epoxy, uh, carbon fiber based on, on uh, seaweed or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's not only necessary, but it's also going to give us a much more efficient uh, product. But um, when we were talking before, the, uh, before we started this talk, um, the dilemma that we have, is, and always have, and everybody has, is that you have the academics working to develop new materials. Um, and then you have the industries working for applications. And NASA has defined the development of technology from TRL-1, which is just a bright idea, to TRL-9, which is production, putting it into the airplane. So the low TRLs, TR-1, 2, and 3, is what gets done in the universities, in the academia. And, and the higher, 7, 8, 9, is what we do here in Boeing. But um, there's no professional class of people that work in the mid-TRLs, and it, uh, they call it the chasm of death or the valley of death, or, but it basically it's uh, a lot of good ideas that are in the, the university when they try to leap over that midsection and get into the factory floor into production, they fail because of various reasons. So. Um, there's, there's a lot of conferences. There's, this particular one was a, a conference in France, and they were uh, focused totally on that subject. How do we move good ideas from the lab table to the factory floor? <coughs> 
And that's, that's, that's really what's um, holding back nanotechnology right now. There's great stuff going on in academia. But um, as, as wonderful as the new science and the potential is, we, we still are faced with the requirements, the classical requirements of putting out an airplane and putting people on an airplane. Um, it takes, it's taken many years. The, the composite material that went on the 787, we probably spent about 10 years of very active um, testing and evaluating, working with the suppliers before we get comfortable with putting it on an airplane. Um, we have to have supplier chain involvement. Typically, uh, we might have a professor from a university come and say, you know, I just uh, in invented this great new thing. We want to work with Boeing and we want to put it in your wings. Um, that won't work. We have to have the whole value chain. We have to have the material supplier. And there's maybe four or five entities between the, uh, the university and Boeing, or the University of Boeing, however you want to look at it. And, and they have to be in there from the beginning. They have to be part of the development team. And then w our success stories have done that. Um, and and the, the other entities are the ones that can take it and scale it up. Uh, because if you have a professor who, professor at Univer uh, Washington State University created a, a wonderful new material, but it's, you know, it's in a, it's in a little dish. So how, how can you get it up to, uh, a million pounds or a hundred thousand pounds in pr production, those entities in the middle of the value chain are the ones that are skilled in scale up quality assurance. They have to be part of the team. You have to consider that when you're inventing the, the new materials and the new applications. Ultimately, we have to convince the uh, FAA that this is a good good opportunity, a good material, good application. So um, they also have to be brought along on this path. But the, uh, the big issue, the new issue, you, when you have a composite material, it has a polymeric matrix and it has carbon fibers or glass fibers. Now when we have a nano composite material, you're introducing a whole nother set of constituents, whether it's nanotubes or whatever, and a whole nother set of parameters and process issues. And it's, it's, we recognize that it's not possible to do what we did on the 787, where we spent 10 or 15 years developing that material. If we have another material, a nanomaterial, that has all of these wonderful functionalities, it'll take 100 years if we do it the old way. So we have to have the modeling capability. We have to have the computer analysis. We have to be able to certify it with uh, analysis as well as testing. And that's a big issue because none of those models exist today. So the, the, um, the key drivers for any application, whether it's nano or micro or metal or anything, it has to be affordable. And one, one thing that we uh, often talk about is that affordability is not just the price of the airplane. It's what it costs to operate it, what it costs to maintain it, repair it, and what it's worth when ultimately when you sell it. And all those things put together are called TAROC, total, operating, uh, total airplane related operating costs. And that's what determines whether the airline will buy it or not buy it. And we want breakthrough performance as, as usual. And we also want uh, uh, environmental friendliness. Um, we have programs going out in biofuels. It turns out one of the biggest benefits to uh, reduced emissions is reduced weight. So we're, we've been working on reducing weight for, for decades. So it's good to find out that the, uh, if you reduce the max takeoff weight, tremendous reduction in uh, the obnoxious emissions for the whole flight. And, and also we have programs working toward uh, uh, how can you have these plastic materials, this plastic airplane, how can you, how can you derive those polymers from um, renewable resources rather than um, petroleum 
or non-renewable resources. So we have programs, and as everybody does, in um, bio epoxy, or uh, carbon fiber based on, on uh, seaweed or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's not only necessary, but it's also going to give us a much more efficient uh, product. But um, when we were talking before the uh, before we started this talk, um, the dilemma that we have is, and always have, and everybody has, is that you have the academics working to develop new materials, um, and then you have the industries working for applications. And NASA has defined the development of technology from TRL-1, which is just a bright idea, to TRL-9, which is production, putting it into the airplane. So the low TRLs, TR-1, 2, and 3, is what gets done in the universities, in the academia. And, and the higher, 7, 8, 9, is what we do here in Boeing. But um, there's no professional class of people that work in the mid-TRLs. And it, they call it the chasm of death or the valley of death. Or, but it basically, it's uh, a lot of good ideas that are in the, the university when they try to leap over that midsection and get into the factory floor into production, it failed because of various reasons. So um, there's, there's a lot of conferences. There's, this particular one was a, a conference in France, and they were uh, focused totally on that subject. That how do we move good ideas from the lab table to the factory floor? <coughs> And that's, that's, that's really what's um, holding back nanotechnology right now. There's great stuff going on in academia. We haven't put it into our airplane yet. And we ha already have some substantial history in this. In 2005, um, prior to the 787, if you may recall, there was another airplane called the Santa Cruz, or a very swoopy, beautiful, Airplane. All the engineers loved it. <clears throat> the airlines didn't care for it too much. But um, back then, the vice president of uh, the Santa Cruiser sent out a, a message and said, what is this stuff called nanotechnology, and how can it help the Santa Cruiser? So there wasn't anybody who could answer it in Boeing. There was one guy in St. Louis who had a little hint of what it was about. Um, so we had a, a, a three-day workshop. We invited about 75 experts from around the world, literally, came from Asia and Europe and the US and the labs and universities and industry. And they came and we worked for three days defining what it is, building roadmaps of where we wanted to go. It was a, it was a great effort. We had, you know, you'd see people down on their hands and knees there. Those are CEOs and professors and they just got carried away with the whole road mapping exercise. But out of, out of those thousands of ideas and, and, and subjects that we had as a result of that roadmap workshop, we got you know maybe a, a dozen or so that were the top issues. Um, and, and they are you know electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, acoustic uh, damping enhancements, um, engineered materials, adhesives and bonding, how can we we can make the adhesives and bonding better. We can get rid of fasteners. Um, we, just, we talked about the tools, computer modeling, analyses, uh, material characterization, QA methods. If we don't have, this is the real, one of the big challenges. If we don't have a way of, suppose we find a, a, a way of putting nanotubes in material and it performs wonderfully. But if we don't have the QA tools to assure that every batch of material, every roll of material, every foot of material has those tiny little things distributed appropriately, um, then we can't build airplanes with it. So absolute critical is the QA. <laughs> um, hydrophobic, isophobic coatings, of course, that's, that's a dream that we would love to see uh, in reality. Um, Resonant fusion is a growing um, technology or process for manufacturing 
of uh, uh, composite, large composite parts. The, the, uh, the unfortunate part is that to date, whenever you put the nanoparticles in there, it raises the viscosity so much that it makes it almost impractical. So we have a dilemma. People want resonant fusion, they want new technology, but when you put them together, they don't work so far. Um, and how can we make better power source, better batteries, better fuel cells uh, with, the, with the, the power and the electrical properties of nanotubes? So there's a lot of uh, issue, really great issues, and those, those were, again, those were 2005. The bottom line is they're still on our wish list. <laughs> We haven't accomplished any of those, and it's 2009. And we've just added a few to our wish list. Um, but the, the main thing is affordability. How do we, how can we make these uh, materials affordable? And uh, even though they're very small, they're very small quantities, to date, uh, nanotubes, nanofibers, nanoplatelets are relatively expensive. They have come down several orders of magnitude in the past past uh, several years, but they're still, compared to other constituents, extremely expensive. So that's what we need. We need affordability. We need to get some commercial applications. We need to get nanotechnology in a part where we can point to the 787 and say that that door is better now because we have nanotechnology in it. Uh, and so far we have not done that, and neither has anybody else. But that's, that's like the first step. Once that happens, the others will just follow very rapidly. So we, we had an, a, a number of people who have come to us and asked that question, how can we get, get uh, what, what can we do to help you get nanotechnology into your plant? The, the pragmatic, the practical approach we thought was rather than take nanotubes and try to put them into the structure, there's a lot of issues with doing that. The simplest, maybe straightforward approach is to make a super, look for superficial applications. What can we put on the surface of the existing structure? Um, it's it's easier to it's easier to, to qualify. It's easier to certify. The business issues are less complex because we don't get into the chemistry or the the contracts of uh, a company like Torre or what that already supplies materials. So, so we picked, um, we had people from MIT and some other sources, and uh, so we picked four applications. Because basically, it, it's very, it was very common that um, you, you would have labs like Oak Ridge National Lab or MIT labs and come to you and say, what can we do for you? How can we help you in your, in your goals? We have great people, we have great facilities. So we picked these four and uh, the first one was ice phobic coatings. Uh, we have um, a, lot of, a lot of effort goes into uh, protecting against ice that it might accumulate in flight. There are anti-icing uh, systems in the wing leading edge. There's the, you can see the picture of the spray uh, that they do at the airports. Uh, if we could have a nanotechnology coating that you could put on there and reliably um, eliminate the threat of ice forming, um, and that's the key, because it has to be 100% reliable cannot be almost <laughs> almost reliable um, that that would um, that would be a huge thing and so that was one of our our top four same thing with windshell coatings if you have a hydrophobic um, we talked to some people in aerodynamics and they said you know if we could have this kind of surface on a wing we could we could get uh, significant reductions in drag um, can, nanoscale is too small to do anything, but uh, could you have nano self-assembly build a surface that is designed for um, aerodynamic improvements? Again, you don't have to, this kind of approach, you don't have to uh, do anything to the wing. You don't have to change the wing. You don't have to change the material. You just put a surface on there. And then um, 
a big thing inside your airplane is uh, static electric shielding or electromagnetic interference shielding, uh, EMI, ESD. Um, we could we, we could spend a lot of time trying to make the the material, the structure, the inside the airplane uh, electrically conductive, but it, it might be more practical and near-term solution would be to make a film that could be applied to whatever is in there now. And so you don't have to change whatever is in there now, you just apply that film. And uh, we, do, we do have a, we're, we're partners in a um, NSF goalie grant with uh, WSU and, and UW, which has turned out to be very successful. We just had a, a two-year report out two weeks ago. Um, it, it's, it's going to be very good, and we built the one value chain, the, the value chain. So we, along with those two, two universities in Boeing, we also have a material supplier for the thermoplastics, and we have a material supplier for the nano that are part of the team. So, um, just to, that's just a summary of uh, what we've just been talking about there, but. Um, same thing with systems. We've been talking about structures, but in systems world, we have opportunities to make more efficient batteries, more more efficient uh, filtering systems. All of the systems that are inside the airplane are uh, similar to systems in our house, in our home, in our factories. We have probably all the technologies possible inside an airplane. Um, but could we do that with systems? Uh, again, the, in this case, if you can improve a black box, you just take the old one out, put the new one in. So a very, very small uh, issue as far as uh, certification or contracts or business issues. Or, so the, we're looking at, for structures, we're looking at superficial or super uh, solutions near-term solutions, and then we also look at inside the airplane for the systems opportunities for nanotechnology. I think I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip through here. The important issue is um, education, as I mentioned in the beginning, and uh, we, we, we've had a whole series of workshops. As I mentioned, the first one is 2005, the last one was uh, 2008, and our next one is uh, early next year each one focusing on a different area, and then each one bringing in 70 to 80 external experts. We have 30 to 40 Boeing people. They mix for three days. They share our needs, our capabilities. Uh, it works out very well. We've also uh, pulled in some of the top academics and had them give us classes. Uh, the first one was in 2005, Joe Koo from Texas. Um, then we had Katie Zong from WSU. She did two two week long courses, one in one in Everett, one in Renton. Uh, we have Sa Satish Kumar from Georgia Tech on nanomechanics. Uh, and then just a few weeks ago, we had what's called the boot camp, the ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, um, and Boeing pulled in a whole set of. Uh, experts, maybe five or six professors, and uh, we had two days of, uh, of talking and working and getting smarter together. It was very effective. Um, so I, I think I'll skip what we did. Um, there's also, um, to, to, to indicate how important this is, uh, in, uh, when was it, April, the NSF and the NNI and several other government Department of Education and some industry people. Uh, we we met down at uh, USC for a couple of days and and took talked about what what are the real needs for ac academic education from K to 12 up through graduate school um, and from this. Um, the uh, NSF and the DOE will publish a, uh, a document. It's about it's about 100 pages long. Last time I saw the draft, uh, it should be published shortly. So if anybody is interested in learning more about that, it will be available. I can point you toward that. But 
uh, one of the things that came out of that workshop is, you know, there's a tremendous and growing number of sources where, where you can get nanotechnology educated. And, um, and it's the lists are growing every, every day. Um, there's even some very interesting things going on for kids, uh, particularly the dragonfly. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but that it's a, a nanotechnology uh, TV show. Um, it's fascinating, actually. I, I watched it. There's been about 12 episodes. Um, there's there's nano days. Um, I, I put a one-liner down at the bottom because uh, WSU has a um, annual statewide uh, science fair competition, which they host. And uh, I, John Palmer, who is part of this group, uh, uh, got me involved in that for the past two years. And almost invariably, the, uh, the, uh, the projects, they're, they're superb, they're excellent. And they almost always involve some form of nanotechnology. So it's, it's the awareness of it is already down to the, 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 the younger levels. Russ? So the price of materials has come down remarkably as we get scaling of production. Do you think that same scaling law will apply to nanomaterials as well? Uh, yes. Um, the, um, the nanotubes have come down maybe three or four orders of magnitude. But, but they were enormously expensive to start with. And so it's... Uh, it's still not down where we want to see it. Um, there's a lot of work being done at, uh, for instance, Michigan State University and Washington State University, looking for alternatives to nanotubes that are less expensive. And, and a couple of those are nanofibers and uh, uh, nanographite platelets. They, they, they're different, but they can work uh, some magic similar to nanotubes. And they are very, very inexpensive. And then, depending also on what you're interested in, if, you, if you're just looking for erasing the thermal properties, you probably don't need a carbon uh, product. You can get by with something less expensive like nano clay or nano pos or something like that. So, but um, it will come down. On one, that line on my slide, we need a commercial application. We need to get it out in flying or driving or somewhere out there, and then uh, the price will come down, just like any other market situation. So Russ, I do have a question for you. So I'm, my baby and I are wondering, obviously you're talking highly of the collaboration piece, and I was wondering, Where's the balance between competition, that is being the first ones to develop such and such technology, yeah, yeah. and collaboration, and how does that play out in the business world? Well, I, one of the things we have to keep in mind is we want, uh, our, our, our bottom line is to sell airplanes. We don't want to collect patents. We don't want to have an enormous portfolio of IP and we just want to sell airplanes or whatever work. And the uh, competitive cycle is such that in, in, in many ways, within three or four years, the technology is being replaced by something newer. So holding on to that more than a certain, some people argue 10 years, some may argue two years, but, but holding on to that technology too long is just expensive. You have to maintain the patents. You have to protect them. Um, so there, and also there are areas called pre-competitive, like air safety, uh, in which we don't try to be uh, competitive with Airbus or, or Bombardier. Everybody wants air safety. So there is a couple of issues there. We, but the bottom line is we want to be able to compete in the market. Uh, and use that technology until it's no longer uh, of, the, of value. So collaboration it involves compromise. 
but it also involves great benefits, one of which is you get the technology sooner because you might find the problem that you're trying to solve has already been solved in some other country. Uh, so working together, we, 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 we need to share that, but at the same time, we're, we're, we're pulling the answer in much, much sooner. So there's, there's a lot of benefits. Hi, Russ. I have a question. Um, is this technology being employed in the 787, or is this on down the line? I came a little late. You probably already explained it. Um, it's not on the 787 now, but it's it's destined for next generation airplanes, definitely. Yeah, the 787 designed years ago, so uh, we um, probably will see it on the next airplane. It's very, very close now in certain areas like systems um, or, or, or ducting or something like that. Russ, I'm curious about the uh, consumer applications in, in nanotech and you know, thinking of last winter, I would love a, an ice phobic Lamborghini, but uh, they're out of my range. I did see them today. They look great. And I know they're talking about the carbon fiber and all the, all the technology they have in those cars, but what about the more uh, within range consumer technology uh, involving nanotech? Can we get ice phobic vehicles in the near future? Um, I, don't, I don't know about ice phobic vehicles, but you can. You can go on the web sites and find lots of products that already have nanotubes on them, like, uh, uh, what, what was that company? Um, sports equipment, anyway. They're, they're selling uh, carbon fiber um, tennis rackets or golf clubs or something that have nano in them. If they put them in wisely, it will give you a benefit. Uh, if they're just putting them in there for marketing, uh, that's, that's about what what you get. But uh, somebody did a report on, on that subject and it, there's hundreds and hundreds of applications where nano is already in there. Um, one, one of the uh, professors came to our, one of our workshops in 2007 or 2008 and uh, he was wearing a, a golf jacket that he got from Walmart and, and it had nanoparticles in there that repelled uh, water, hydrophobic coating. And he said it works great. Uh, it's simple. You don't have to worry about certification or structures. Or you just put it in there and it, and it repels water better than whatever the predecessor was. So I think getting it on the airplane is one of the hardest places to put it. But if you do a little search, uh, it's not hard to find uh, applications and products that are already out there now with, with these kind of benefits. Eros, are nanoparticle products different or better? So are they radically different in the properties that they have? So you have to think of using them in a completely different way and designing in a different way, or are they just better and you just think of the same part only in a different material? The, um, while talking about the particles, they're very different. And one, one of the advantages, and we talk about the price of them you know, being very expensive, but if, uh, if, if it's done right, you only need a very, very small amount. And in fact, w the, the project that we have with WSU to make uh, PEI thermoplastics uh, electrically conductive, it, it improved the conductivity by 11 orders of magnitude with less than a half a percent by weight of nanotubes. So it's a very, very powerful additive. Uh, but there's a lot of smarts goes into how to put that in the PEI, disperse it, uh, make, make it, uh, make all the particles link up to percolation uh, network has to be formed. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. And it's a lot of, a lot of cleverness goes in there, but uh, uh, in, in the end, it, it, it would be a very, very small uh, amount of material that goes in there. The part, the, the final part itself, 
hopefully will be uh, almost indistinguishable from from the previous part, the non-nano part, but it will be better. It will be stronger. It will have more than one functionality. Um, but as far as manufacturing, it should not uh, should not uh, cause any problems in the factory, cause any additional equipment to be purchased. Uh, we, we want it to be essentially invisible to the current manufacturing um, system. But the final performance would be enhanced.